So with Civil War behind us, we look to the future of Marvel Explained videos, and I think that we have probably picked one of the best characters to do a video explanation on, because Franklin Richards is very important in the realm of Marvel Comics, not necessarily because of what he can do and because of the vast powers that he has, or even the stories that he's involved in, but because of what he represents. But in order to make Franklin Richards make sense, in order to understand him as a character and his impact on Marvel Comics, we actually need to jump back and we need to start with some of the beginnings of comic books as a whole and discuss how it was that comic books came about and ultimately the significance of Franklin Richards in Marvel Comics. So in the world of comic books, we have what's referred to as the golden age of comics. And the golden age of comics is exactly what it sounds like. It's the important, the significant, the what many, many people consider to be the best age of comic books in the history of all comics. And the reason for this is because the golden age of comics created a lot of new standards when it came to comic books. For one, it brought comic books out of being a secondary thing. Comic books, for the most part, didn't really exist before the golden age of comics. They did to a degree, sporadically, you may find comics here and there, but for the most part, they existed in the backs of, uh, of published magazines. They existed in the back of newspapers and so on. They weren't really something you could go into a store and buy. The Golden Age of Comics took that element away. The Golden Age of Comics took these comic books that were in the back of magazines and in the back of newspapers and put them into a single publication that you could physically go into a store and purchase. But more so than that, the Golden Age of Comics created archetypes. And archetypes were the most important thing and remain the most important thing in the world of comics. And of all the superheroes and all these different characters that have ever come out of uh, the Golden Age of Comics, the single most important superhero is Superman. Now, I recognize that Superman is not a Marvel comic publication, but Superman's importance in the realm of comic books cannot be overstated. And the reason why is because Superman created the archetype for comic book superheroes. He was the blueprint. He was the original. And virtually all other superheroes that would ever appear in comic books forevermore will model, for the most part, the archetype that was laid down by Superman. Now, there are some exceptions to this. For example, uh, Name of the Submariner and Wolverine, but these characters were designed to be anti-heroes. They were designed to be superheroes that took a different road. They took a much darker road, and they did less savory things, but the ultimate goal was to come about to the same uh, end result that your normal uh, Superman archetype superheroes would do in order to achieve that result. But what we also saw with the Golden Age of Comics is that, for the most part, they modeled real-world events, especially when we look at Timely and Atlas comics. Now, with regards to Timely and Atlas comics, these were comics that were under the ownership of a man named Martin Goodman. And Martin, Martin Goodman was, for the most part, a marketing genius when it came to the idea of comic book publications. Martin, uh, Martin Goodman owned a publication, I believe, called Pulp Comics. And Pulp Comics was the main umbrella. It was the main big company that he owned. And Timely Comics, Atlas Comics, and even the at the time, the much smaller uh, Marvel Comics all existed as subsidiaries of uh, Martin Goodman of Pulp Comics. But what we saw is that as time progressed, as the 30s led into the 40s, and the 40s began to lead into the 50s, we saw World War II going on. And World War II really gave uh, Timely and Atlas Comics and even Marvel Comics an identity of sorts in the sense that they revealed to us Captain America. And Captain America is, by leaps and bounds, the most significant character that existed in Marvel Comics or Timely and Atlas Comics in the 1940s. He elevated these publications to the height of their popularity at the time. Because Captain America, as we had discussed in both our Captain America video and our Bucky Barnes video, was the epitome of what it meant to be an American. He was the epitome of what it meant to support America. He was the greatest, uh, the single greatest piece of American propaganda to ever come out of either of these comic book publications. But the problem that we saw here is that once World War II began to end, once World War II began to taper off, and we moved from World War II into the Cold War and the conflict between uh, the United States and Russia and the proxy wars of the Cold War, the Korean War and the Vietnam War and so on, that 
Captain America lost his identity, and by virtue of Captain America losing his identity, Timely and Atlas Comics didn't really have a way to cope with this. The entire basis behind their popularity was built on a war that is no longer going on, and so what we saw was that Timely and Atlas Comics began to phase out, they began to go away, and that Marvel Comics took over them entirely. But even then, Marvel Comics wasn't a wildly successful uh, publication. It was to a degree, but it was nothing like we would see under the leadership of Stanley and Jack Kirby and the Silver Age of comics that took place in the late and uh, early 1950s and 1960s. So the Silver Age of Comics is what I like to refer to as the Superheroes Age of Comics. And the reason for this is because while the Golden Age of Comics had introduced us to various superheroes, name of the Submariner, Captain America, Superman, Wonder Woman, and so on, the Golden Age of Comics and even the years preceding that or coming after that before the Silver Age of Comics came in, uh, really for the most part kept comic books as a sort of comedic element. They just introduced a lot of funny comics. And superheroes weren't really a main stage thing. They weren't really a huge thing. They were there from time to time, especially when it came to uh, DC Comics. But for the most part, Marvel, Timely, and Atlas Comics had maintained this comedic element, this science element, and really had left uh, superheroes on the back burner. But then in 1960, I believe, DC DC took a huge risk, made a big gamble, and it paid off. And in response to this, Marvel was uh, Marvel had to up their ante. This decision was DC creating a group called the Justice League of America. The Justice League of America was a huge action. It was a huge event in the world of DC. And the reason why is because, as I understand it, this brought to us our very first mainstream superhero group in comic books. And so Marvel had to respond to this. Marvel had to find some way to up the ante and to do something that wouldn't be viewed as a copy of the Justice League of America and an attempt to, I guess, maybe stay in the game regarding superheroes and comics. And so in 1961, under Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, Marvel introduced the Fantastic Four. And this is one of the reasons why Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and also Steve Ditko are considered to be some of the most important characters or some of the most important people in the world of Marvel Comics. The reason why they're considered so significant is because they introduced not only some of the greatest superheroes and greatest individuals to have ever appeared in Marvel Comics, but also because of the stories they wrote and the way in which they challenged the belief systems and the moral philosophies and the viewpoints of the, the people who were reading these various comics. The Fantastic Four brought to us a superhero family, and this superhero family functioned the exact same way you would expect to see a family function. They bickered with one another. They argued with one another. But more so than that, the comic books mirrored real-world events. When the space race was going on between the United States and Russia, we saw this being mirrored in the, uh, the Fantastic Four comics. But as time progressed, what we saw was that Martin Goodman, who had previously owned uh, Atlas, Timely Comics, and at that point in time in the 1960s, Marvel Comics, sold the company for $50 million to the Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation. And when this purchase, or when this sale was made, what we saw was that a man named Martin Ackerman had come to, uh, to the head of the entire Marvel Corporation. But where Martin Goodman had put focus on quality, Martin Ackerman had put focus on quantity. And so what we saw going on here was that where previously Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were focusing on maybe four or five or six publications, we now saw the publications swelling in number based on the success that we had seen with the superhero uh, comic book series in the 1960s. In addition, because of the fact that there were so many comic books being published now, it was virtually impossible for the quality to remain there, and so the quality began to drop off. And over time, we saw, saw this sort of drop off in Marvel. We eventually began to see things shape up in such a way where quality began to go away almost entirely. We saw that Stan Lee began to take the stance where he didn't want to rock the boat, where he didn't want to challenge the viewpoints of readers anymore, and we began to see these stories that uh, challenge the political and the philosophical and the moral belief systems of readers begin to go away. And this leads us into the discussion on Franklin Richards, to Franklin Richards' introduction in Marvel Comics, and why it is that Franklin Richards is so important in the realm of Marvel Comics.